name. So the OWASP project is the Open, Wasp, Open Web Application Security Project. It's a not-for-profit organization, um, which is basically researching and, and promoting information, getting information out there about what problems, are, uh, what problems exist in terms of security when you're building web applications. The top 10 is sort of their, their banner project. What they do every couple of years is they, they, they issue a formal like, statement, a formal paper, which, which, which uh, enumerates what they see at the moment as the top 10 issues that face people developing web apps at the moment that affect security. Uh, there have been three editions. There's actually been a couple of updates between 2003 and 2007, but the three big editions were 2003, 2010, and 2013. And so, the, and the 2013 is very similar to what was in 2010, but with a couple of things merged and a couple of new points and sort of re re um, revised to reflect changes that people had in bro that have happened in reality. Um, this is obviously a lightning talk. If you want a full version, go to that URL. It's a bit.ly. JKM is Jacob Kaplan Moss, who is one of Django's benevolent dictators for life. Um, and he's also the uh, uh, platform security lead at Heroku. And he gave a full-length 40-minute talk about OWASP specifically and how it applies to Python, but although he was talking specifically about how it applies to Python, the sort of the general message uh, definitely extends well beyond that. So here we go. Very, very quickly, what are the OWASP, OWASP top 10 as of 2013? Number one, injection attacks. So things like SQL injection, um, the idea when you, when you have untrusted data being sent through an interpreter and stuck directly into a query because your hacker can, or a hacker can provide hostile data, trick the interpreter to do something that you weren't intending. Number two, broken authentication and session management. This is an area where people who have got authentication, you log into your system, and as a result of things like timing attacks or the method by which you're using to generate keys or the method you're using to generate or authenticate uh, the tokens for password resets, people are getting in and breaking the system on those edges because there are holes that you aren't aware of in the way you are generating random numbers, for example. Number three is one that's been there for a while, cross-site scripting. This is the idea when your browser is taking user supply, supplied data and just displaying it to the user, and as a result, they're able to inject scripts into your victim's browser, which then, of course, runs as if it was your victim's local, uh, local permissions. Number four, indirect, uh, sorry, insecure direct object references. This isn't always an obvious one, but it sort of makes a lot of sense when you think about it. It's the idea of having a website with a URL that says, you know, myexample.com slash object slash three, where three is the primary key. Well, if three is a key that's there, well, maybe there's a four, maybe there's a five, maybe there's a six, and you can sit there and you can just look at each one of those. Now. It's not inherently by itself insecure, but it does leak information. Like, for example, if you're doing it on invoices, how many invoices have you actually generated? You're just exposing that to the outside world. But it's also, if you haven't locked down the security on individual URLs, you've potentially got a, a problem there as well. Security misconfiguration, making sure your servers and every, all, this, all the software you're using is up to date. Sensitive data exposure, so things like making sure credit cards, tax IDs, authentication credentials are actually being hidden and can't be accessed somewhere they shouldn't. Missing functional level access control. A lot of people will, when they're rendering a UI, not prevent send a button to the user unless they're allowed to see it, but then won't validate that the button, if it's been stimulated by a function, like manually being stimulated, that the URL at the other end won't handle it if the user isn't allowed to press the button in the first place. Cross-site request forgery. This is where a logged on victim's browser gets a forged HTTP request uh, that includes the victim's session cookie uh, which then allows essentially the remote browser to log on to, uh, to, to behave or the, 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 to construct a request that allows the attacker to inject a request onto the server that then acts as if it was the person who was being attacked. Uh, this is actually a good one because uh, that uh, a lot of like, Rails and Django and a number of other web frameworks have actually got built-in protection to, but it, the number of ways you can get those things in there are real problems. Components with known vulnerabilities and unvalidated requests and forwards. Again, there's the URL um, for the video. Much more detail there. Go read it. OK, so up next we have Benno Rice, who's going to be showing off another one of these devices, I believe. And your time, as usual, starts the moment you attempt to connect to the projector. Don't Put worry the about the radio. Okay, 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 I'm going to do the microphone in. Can you hear me up the back if I speak like this? Select one. Oh, I can use the left-hand one. Wow, yeah. gosh, tricky. Okay, well, that's it. The left hand's over here. Yeah, I know that. But this is over here, isn't it? Stop cheating. Why? <laughs> hey, I don't, I don't, I don't break the rules, mate. Click top, Benno, top. Um, so this, 
This, as mentioned by Chris, is a holiday by Moore's Cloud. Actually, I'll throw it over there. <coughs> to you later. I hope you've seen it. It's basically a small um, ARM processor with a, uh, an Arduino hanging off it that's controlling a bunch of lights. Um, we'll wait for that to shut. Um, it was created by a guy called Mark Pesci. If you've heard of Mark Pesci, he used to show up on the new inventors on a regular basis um, and various things like that. Hide my Twitter. What's my Twitter doing? <laughs> Sorry. This is called, hang on, I'm just going to do this and I'm going to hit mirror so I can actually see what I'm doing. Um, hurry up and load displays. Yeah. Okay. Um, it still says it's loading displays. Anyway, okay, so what I have here is a bunch of just really short programs to show what you can do with this because it's not just a thing for telling me when I've run out of time faster than I wanted to, but it, um, it has an API on it, which can be talked, yes, I know, Mark. <laughs> um, so I basically, I, I bought this for two reasons, one of which was just to have fun with it, the other one was to play around with it and get my daughter interested in just what you can do with thinking through programs. So I started out just making fun little things that make colours appear on the on the thing and they just walk around and th these ones stack themselves up over time and then another colour comes in and stacks on the top of it. And this, this one's written in Python, as you can see the code is actually hovering behind here. Um, it's, that's it, that's all that's involved in the, in the API. Um, mainly because it's all wrapped up in that secret holiday secret API, but I can show you that that's <laughs> not actually that amazing either, there we go. Um, it just uses a UDP packet to tell the, the, the colours, to tell it what state to put all the globes in. Um, there's another one that works over HTTP and does JSON, but where's the fun in that? Um, so my good friend Garth also wrote this one in Node. Um, he, he called it Thrash. I came up with one called, uh, I wanted to slow it down a bit, so I ended up renaming it and calling, calling it Mildly Pummel. But... Um, 182255. I can also show you the, the script that I wrote to find my. Uh, oh, yes. How'd that work? Oh, hang on. Let's try. Uh, uh, <laughs> this typing thing while you're not actually looking at your keyboard is kind of interesting. Anyway, sorry. This was worked out all at the last minute because I spent most of it trying to work out where my um, holiday actually was. Um, 255. Dot, what was my IP address? 120.124. There we go. And that just basically blats UDP packets as fast as it can with random colours on it, which is kind of pretty and also probably is freaking out the network. Because <laughs> um, this thing is on the LCA Wi-Fi network, so if... Uh, <coughs> so what you've given us is a network congestion indicator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if it stops working, the network's not working. Um, and so... Just to finish this story off, um, I, I sat down with my daughter and said, so what do you want it to do? And she said that what she wanted was a gold one and a silver one, and then we added a purple one and a pink one to, to walk around the lights. So we went online and we found some RGB colour charts and we got a gold and a silver and a purple and a pink, and you can tell that the silver one came from one that was using hex values because I couldn't be bothered converting them. Um, <laughs> And then I worked out where I wanted them to start and you know what direction they were moving in and then they just walk around on the string. Um, so we can just fire that one up. Uh, somewhere back here. Right, two, 255, 120, 124. Thanks, and Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I was trying to, trying to inform Mark that um, the holiday works great um, when your network allows service discovery. Um, but they've taken rule number one in how do I stop my Wi-Fi network from melting down here, which is turn off multicast and broadcast. That kind of stops that working. Um, so yes, we have lights walking around and yeah, my daughter was very impressed with that. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, so up next we have uh, frames. Ooh, excitement. Or when you start trying to set up your demonstration. <laughs> Darn. Okay. And it starts now. Okay. Amy, come on. Come on. Just start. Oh. 
Alright, um, so one of these buttons is going to make it work, but who knows which. Good luck or with not. that. Or not. Hey! Cool, um, so hi, um, I don't know, I discovered that IPython's a thing like three weeks ago and I've been using it a bit. I don't know if everyone else has seen it, like continuously uses all the time, but it's pretty much brand new to me. Um, so I thought on the off chance no one had seen it, I'd show it off. Um, so this is IPython. Um, it does things. Uh, so it's mostly targeting academic use. It's an alternative to basically Mathematica. Um, if I tip it over to the other window, it'll look different. Uh, it's part of SciPy. Oh, SciPy? Anyway. Um, and it works on the command line. Someone's telling me that its command line version is bet worse than B Python. I don't know. Um, anyway, what it's not is I'm Python. That's something else entirely, but I might slip up and say I'm Python because I've had four hours sleep. Okay, um, so that is a thing. Uh, so before I say what's to like, because apparently I'm very negative and start with what's bad first, um, here's a list of things that's not good about it. Uh, most of it's fair, okay. It's not multi-user, but apparently there's a multi-user version. Um, I am running this in a screen session. That's why I can tell that's how you're meant to run it. Um, they're in package out of date, but pip makes it work, so I can use the latest one. And yeah, sometimes it crashes. I think that's partially my fault. Um, all right, what is to like? Most things. So um, it's got Markdown. This whole thing was pretty much written in Markdown just then, which means you've got LaTeX. Um, it has HTTPS, and it plays really good with the rest of SciPy. SciPy? SciPy stuff. Anyway, so you can see, look, here's some LaTeX. It's writing LaTeX. Yep. Okay, yeah, so just normal markdown stuff. Um, and so here's it doing what it's normally doing, which is some, well, mathsy stuff. Um, so I've just got these things. I can do things in them. How informative and specific. Um, so. Is so this is it doing markdown. So I was working out this particular function and well, I went and just copied out the formula for it so that I could well, easily see that I'm doing the right code, which eventually I was, and that's LaTeX. That's nice, I like LaTeX. Um, and so you can see down, do do do, more stuff, more markdown. No pictures. No, get pictures. So in this case, I'm doing some stuff with a restricted Boltzmann machine and training it to make, recognize, and regenerate numbers. So I can go through and I can tweak that a little bit because it's handy for that. So right now I've got a very small sample size. And let's say I'm going to grab all the things that are supposed to look like sevens or threes. Rerun that line, regenerate my data, and... Uh, it's going to run for a bit, then because it's running in a screen session, I can see that it's probably using up all the CPU on the server. Or it's already done. Okay. Or not. Let's try running. Anyway, um, so has everyone seen IPython except for me? Can you put your hands up if you have seen it? Scientists love it. Okay, that's what, that was what I was generally getting the impression. It is very much the folks at scientific use. But it does tend to do unexplained things to me. <laughs> which is my big complaint with it. We'll see. Maybe that'll um, run or maybe it won't. Do -do -do. Yeah. So, yes, that, which is the thing that's nice on the new version. So, run all. Let's see. Anyway, um, so IPython, it's a thing. I can do it. I can clip it on. Yep. 
and it's on. And I think it counts as start when I it counts as a start when I start looking for the VGA cable. I am looking for the VGA cable. Like that one. That one. So you can start. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one, and. Voila! <laughs> How annoying. Aha! You know, I was actually so smug that this worked perfectly earlier. Yeah. Now that you're under pressure, on pressure connection, turn the screen around and hold it I'm going to have to. <laughs> Put it under the document camera. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was really tempted to do that earlier. Let's see if we have you something. Ah. Nope. Okay. That's. Oh, that's deeply unfortunate. Um, I had a slide. I, I did. I did. And I'll actually show you the slide because it is quite pretty. I worked on it for minutes because it wasn't my work. But what it is, is the New Zealand Python user group logo. And it looks just like every other Python user group logo, except it has the kick-ass little Kiwi's beak down there, which you probably can't see with the laptop. In any event, I am here to announce uh, Kiwi PyCon 2014, and it will be held in 2014. Yay! And I can confirm that it will be held in New Zealand. Yay! And I can further confirm that it will be held somewhere in there, somewhere in there. That's looking very Wellington-ish. That looks like Wellington, even, even from a distance probably. And that also looks like Wellington, but I can't go any further from that because it will either be here or here or here. So uh, I hope you all have made a note of that, and we will see you there when it happens, <laughs> which is September, uh, September-ish. So we will see you in that area in September-ish, and... What I can tell you is that the website is easy to remember. It is kiwi.pycon.org. So I'd like you all to make a note of that. If you go there now, you'll see the 2013 site. But kiwi.pycon.org, it was really big text. It would look really big in that projector. kiwi.pycon.org. And the site will go live in autumn. It'll go live in March. With, and I'll be able to, we'll have much better details then. We might even be able to tell you that it'll be in a building. Um, <laughs> The buildings that we do in, sorry? You have buildings in New Zealand? Don't push your luck. We have buildings there now, but, <laughs> but by March, but by March, we might have one set of buildings, and by September. Oh, I wish you the very best of luck. Thank you very kindly. Um, I will be browbeating many people here to come because you are all awesome people, and our conference is actually really cool. And New Zealand is, I'm sure you will all agree, the right place to be. So come in September, and when the website goes live, I will be browbeating all of you to come visit me in Wellington. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, no props. Some cool, some cool shades for anybody. Yeah, um, Mike. Yes, I can use Mike. I can do that. I like hopping around. So, that one better or this one better? This one. Okay, I know. Does this work for you? Yes. Happy. Okay. Goodness. No. Okay. Is now. Okay, that was fun. Um, Right, back on track. I've been trying to get my kidlinks involved in programming, and that hasn't been easy. 
I learned to program a long time ago in the early 80s. And in the early 80s, we had this text screen. And I learned BASIC first on an Acorn BBC um, at home. Um, before that, slightly ZX80 Sinclair. Um, no external storage. And um, also PDP-8, VT78 terminal. Um, so for some of you, this makes sense. You know, text. Um, so 10 print, little asterisks, 20 go to 10, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, I was really excited when a little Christmas tree would, print, uh, would appear on the line printer. Yeah, who else has done this? Okay, we're not talking instant gratification here. Um, but given the fact that no one else that I knew had ever touched a computer, this was really, really cool. Now, wind forward to 2013, 2014, I get complaints to my kid, from my kids, that, um, by the way, I used to have one, I now have four, um, I acquired a whole extra family blended thing, so that, just to update you on my family life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> some of you know about it, so I need to update. Um, yeah, so they complain to me that their computer is laggy when they play Minecraft. That is the kind of attitude we have now, which is perfectly fine, but kids these days, yes, they're all boys and girls. Now, this creates a bit of a problem in trying to teach them programming because some of this programming stuff is exceedingly hard to get to. And I've heard in talks earlier things like just do, simply type. Um, any of you who have ever been to a Lana Brindley talk will know that this doesn't work in documentation and it really doesn't work when enticing someone who really doesn't have a clue what is going on in that computer and it may be slightly scary. Now, my tiddlywings are not entirely scared of computers. I've made them build some. Um, you know, whenever I need a new desktop computer, I just give them the parts and, and guide it a bit and in the end we have a working computer. So that's okay, but programming has been a pest. Now, the first thing that I found that actually does work um, from a book is Scratch. There's an awesome Scratch book and, and one of them has, has started to do that and it was actually the first thing that got her involved in it because there's a, there's a bit of a cartoon in that book and it, it guides it along the way so it has a bit of a narrative and that actually works quite well. Um, Arduinos I found are quite nice. It's not quite instant gratification but it's pretty close and at that point you have something exceedingly visual or physical, you know, lights blink, like that stuff. You know, that kind of thing really works well. I'm not particularly inspired with the code behind it, but it's good. So what I'm trying to get to, we're all smart people here. Some of us are really too smart. For us, it's all really, really easy. Or we come from a background when the instant gratification wasn't really an issue and we were quite happy to stuff around for hours on some obscure syntax to get something sensible out. But um, kids now, they do have a slightly shorter attention span sometimes. You need to get them interested first. And that initial threshold appears to be a problem. I've seen some kids Python book online and it just doesn't work. I've browsed through it and it doesn't do it for me. Um, and I know a little bit about how my kids work. It's not going to fly. Um, so I'm here to ask you guys to catch me along the way in during the week and talk to me about ways um, that might interest either your kids or my kids and I'll blog about it. Um, to get them involved in, in some kind of basic programming. Some of them are not necessarily particularly interested in programming for its own sake, but they'd like to do other stuff. Yeah, and that is also really, really important, I think. Um, so my, my stepson, uh, Max, is here. He doesn't really care about, um, about programming, but um, he's really into physics and astronomy and, you know, anything like that. It will, by my notion, essentially involve some programming. So some way to get him, you know, on the edge of that, um, that actually grasps his, his, um, his interest would be really, really great. Um, a related project I'm, I'm working on, um, rep wraps, so 3D printers. They're open from start to finish, and that is another entry point. Thank you.